Well, good Monday morning to you from Grace and Peace to You Gathering here in Rockbridge County, Virginia. I promise to give you five days of readings from this book, The Day Christ Was Born, written by Jim Bishop. Um, he has another book, The Day Christ Died. And this has been a tradition for me and my family. I found this book on a shelf at my parents when I was growing up and um, been reading it ever since around Christmas time. I like to share it with my portions of it with my kiddos and I'm sharing the whole book with you until Christmas. So without further ado, let's go into chapter two. Mary was born and raised in Nazareth, the child of an average family. She played on the streets, as the other children did, and she was subject to parental discipline. Joseph knew her, even though he was four years older. All houses in Nazareth were in the same neighborhood because it was a small town. The biggest event that could occur in Nazareth was for a father to take his children to the nearby Greek city of Sephoris to shop in the bazaars. The people were knit closely in their daily lives, and the women met in the morning at the village well. When Mary reached her 13th birthday, it was permissible to ask for her in marriage. The proper form was followed. Joseph first asked his parents if he could marry Mary. He was 17, an apprentice carpenter in the neighborhood and more than a year away from having his own shop. It was assumed that a serious-minded young Jew of 17 was a responsible adult. Joseph's parents discussed the matter of marriage and in time paid a formal call on Mary's parents. The entire neighborhood knew in advance what negotiations were at hand. And from draped doorway to draped doorway, the women discussed it as they washed the stones in front of their houses. Mary was not supposed to know the matter, but had ex facto knowledge of it all along and had made known her wishes to her mother and father. Joseph, who thought it was a deep pending secret, was amazed and embarrassed to find that the boss carpenter and the tradesmen were not only aware of his wishes, but looked at him archly, stroked their beards, and made him the butt of unsmiling jest. The parents engaged in their formal discussion. It was necessary as part of the little ceremony to talk of a dowry, but Mary's people had none. Their economic status was no better and no worse than Joseph's. As long as the man of the house remained in good health, they would not starve. When the two mothers and two fathers were agreed, the quittation took place. This is a form of betrothal and much more binding than any other. The quittation is a finality of marriage. Once the marriage contract was negotiated, even though the marriage ceremony had not occurred, the bridegroom-to-be could not rid of his betrothed except through divorce. The Kurdishan in Judea also entitled the couple to lawful sexual relations, even though each of the parties was still living at home with his parents. However, in the country of Galilee and in the south, the people had renounced the privilege more than 500 years before and purity was maintained through the final marriage vows. Still, if Joseph had died between quitation and marriage, Mary would have been his legal widow. If, in the same period, another man had had knowledge of her, Mary would have been punished as an adulteress. The waiting time was spent, according to custom, in shopping for a small home and furniture. The Nisuan, or wedding ceremony, would be almost anticlimactic. A big part of the ceremony was a solemn welcome of the bridegroom to his bride at the door of his new home. Throughout the engagement, Mary, of course, lived with her parents and accepted the daily chores set out for her. 
At the time, midway between engagement and formal marriage, Mary was alone one day and was visited by the angel Gabriel. She was alarmed, to be sure, but not as frightened as she would have been had she not heard stories of such visits from the elders. Mary lived after the days of the great prophets, the great visions, the visitations. Gabriel stood before her and saw a dark, modest child of fourteen. Rejoice, child of grace, he said. The Lord is your helper. You are blessed above, beyond all women. Mary did not like the sound of the last sentence. Her hands began to shake. Why should she, a little country girl, be blessed beyond all women? Did it mean that she was about to die? Was she being taken, perhaps, to a far-off place, never again to see her mother and father and, and Joseph? She said nothing. She tried to look away, not only because of the terror, but because it was considered bad manners in Judea for one to stare directly into the eyes of another. But her eyes were magnetized. She stared and lowered her eyes and stared again. Gabriel's voice softened. Do not tremble, Mary, he said. You have found favor in the eyes of God. Behold, you are to be a mother and to bear a son and to call him Jesus. He will be great. Son of the Most High will be his title. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. He will be king over the house of Jacob forever. And to his kingship, there will be no end. The words did not calm Mary. Vaguely, she understood that she was to be a mother of a king of kings. But who might this be? And how could it occur when she was not even married? How will this be? She said, Charlie, since I remain a virgin. It was Gabriel's turn to become specific. He stood in soft radiance in the room and explained, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For this reason, the child to be born will be acclaimed holy and son of God. She now understood the words, but they added to her bewilderment. What the angel was saying, she reasoned, was something of which the Jews had been waiting for centuries. A Messiah, a Savior, God come to earth as he promised long ago. Mary shook her head. Not to her, not to her. Gabriel sensed the child needed more proof. Note moreover, he said, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. She who was called the barren, nothing indeed is impossible for God. Her eyes lowered to the earthen floor and her head inclined too. She comprehended. She also understood that the angel had told her about her old cousin Elizabeth, whom she had not seen in some time, so that the fruitfulness of her kinswoman would be the earthly seal of proof to the heavenly words. She, a young virgin, was to be blessed by the Holy Spirit, and she would bear a male child, child who would be God. It was an enormous honor, but she had been taught to accept and obey the will of God from the first moments of early understanding. Regard me as the humble servant of the Lord, she murmured. May all you have said be fulfilled in me. The angel stood before her in silence, fading slowly from her vision, bit by bit, until all that was visible was the wall. Mary's impulse was to run and find her mother. She must tell, she must ask counsel. She must convince her mother that she was not inventing the story. Exultation came, and it was transmitted to anguish. It was not a dream, or was it? Could one dream standing wide awake in one's house? No, it was not a dream. She knew that it could not be, because she could not have devised the words that Gabriel used. Now, for a moment, she had trouble remembering them. She wrung her hands and prayed for recollection. Full recollection. She had to know every word, and more important, to understand every word. She prayed and thought and prayed. Little by little, the words and phrases returned until, like a familiar litany, she could recite them without hesitation. She thought again of her mother and decided not to tell. If the angel had wanted her mother to know, he would have come when her mother was at home, so that both of them would have knowledge of this thing. He had deliberately selected a time when she was alone. Therefore, it must be the will of God that she she keep the secret anyway if her mother or anyone else knew the secret they would tell it to her and thus she would know which human beings God has selected to know the, of the honor 
Surely, she thought, Joseph would know. He was her intended husband. The angel would have to tell Joseph. If he didn't, then what would Joseph think when she became great with child and he knew the baby wasn't, was not his? Oh, yes, the angel would surely tell Joseph. Within a few days, Mary asked as casually as possible for permission to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Her brother thought it was a touching sign of devotion and sent her off with a family traveling south to Judea. The young virgin said nothing about her secret. Some of the time, she seemed to be friends. She seemed to her friends to be lost in the frowning reverie. Elizabeth was gray and wrinkled, and she had spent many years in the balcony of the synagogue asking God for a child. Her husband, Zachary, was a priest, a small town teacher, who had once been selected by the great priest of Jerusalem to be the one to enter the holy place and offer the incense. He felt sorrier. For his Elizabeth than he did for himself in the matter of childlessness. His, he understood the natural maternal feelings of Elizabeth and unknown to her he had prayed to get in again for a child. Sometimes the visit of Mary the angel Gabriel had a, sometime, excuse me, sometime before the visit of Mary the angel Gabriel had appeared before Zachary in the temple and told him that God had answered their prayers. Elizabeth would give birth to a son in June, and she must call him John. Sometime, someday in the distant future, he would be called the Baptist, and he would go ahead of the Messiah, preaching and baptizing as he went. Elizabeth was standing in the doorway as Mary came up the walk. It was as though she had expected the visit. Mary, an affectionate child, shouted a happy greeting before she reached the door. Elizabeth felt her baby move within her, and in raising her hand in greeting, suddenly burst into tears. Blessed are you, she said, beyond all women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Mary stopped part way to the door. Her mouth hung open. She could not speak. Elizabeth knew. Elizabeth knew the secret. Elizabeth wiped her eyes and tried to smile. How privileged am I, she, she said to her niece, to have the mother of my Lord come to visit me. Hear me now, as the sound of your greeting fell upon the ear, my ears, the babe in my womb leaped for joy. Happy is she who believed that what was told her on behalf of the Lord would be fulfilled. The last sentence was a quasi-warning for the young girl to erase all doubt from her mind and become reconciled to the greatest duty of all ages. Mary had not doubted. She had believed the words, but she could not convince herself that she was the one of all women on earth selected to bear the baby. Now she was convinced. She no longer tried to divorce her person from the prophecy. She had told no one the secret, and here Elizabeth not only knew about it, but was pregnant exactly as the angel had said she would be. A wave of exultation filled the heart of Mary. The young girl no longer wondered and worried about her part in God's will. She became lyrical, and she stood before her cousin, arms outstretched, eyes dimmed and half closed with tears of joy, and she uttered words which remain engraved in the heart of Elizabeth for all days. My soul extols the Lord, and my spirit leaps for joy in God my Savior. How graciously he looked upon his lowly maid. Oh, behold, from this hour onward, age after age will call me blessed. How sublime is what he has done for me, the mighty one whose name is holy. From age to age, he visits those who worship him in reverence. His arms achieve the mastery. He routs the haughty and proud of heart. He puts down princes from their thrones and exalts the lowly. He fills the hungry with blessings and sends away the rich with empty hands. He has taken by the hand his servant Israel and mercifully kept his faith. And he has promised our fathers with Abraham and his posterity forever and ever more. The women embraced, and Mary wondered what made her think of these words. The young girl remained with Elizabeth until June, a week prior to the birth of John. Mary was three months pregnant, and her parents had sent word that she should be at home preparing for her wedding. Yes, the wedding. Elizabeth now enjoyed Mary's complete confidence, and the two wondered if Joseph knew. It was important that he know what was about to happen and to understand.
When Mary arrived home, he saw her husband-to-be. He was not happy that she had chosen to be away from him for three months, and if he knew the secret, he hid it well. He had heard from Mary's mother that Elizabeth was the bare child, but surely there were others in her town who could have attended her. The young girl did not dispute Joseph. She decided from his attitude that he knew nothing of the great secret. She would not marry him without telling something of it. I'm going to have a baby, she said. The shock to Joseph was beyond measure. Throughout the courtship, his intended bride had won an aura of innocence. He was painfully conscious of her lack of knowledge. She had gone away three months ago, and now she returned to say she was pregnant. It is impossible to read the depths of sorrow on both hearts. He looked at her tenderly, and she offered no word of explanation. She looked away from him and wished that she might tell him everything. The baby was going to need a foster father who better than the man she loved, the gentle and pious and patient Joseph. The thought crossed her mind that he had been selected for the role for these very reasons. He would be an ideal guardian for the infant. Then why? Why had he not been told? What wrench? Why wrench two young hearts in tragedy? when the truth was as bright as the sun and as warming. On the tip of her tongue, Mary had the greatest secret of all history. She could not unlock her tongue. Joseph went away from her to think. Of the two, he was the more pitiable. He loved this girl with all his heart, and he had visions of a long and faith, fruitful life with her. Now he felt she had betrayed him, and he could not understand the betrayal, nor even force himself to believe that it was true. Joseph kept his awful secret. He could divorce her publicly. If he did this, he would be impelled to tell the elders the reason. In that case, they would ask Mary if she was a child. If she said yes, Joseph would have had to swear that he was without knowledge of her. The priest would adjure her to be an adulteress, and there was only one penalty for the crime, stoning. The guilty person is led by the townsman to a high cliff in order to jump. If the adulteress refuses, she is pushed. As she lies at the bottom of the cliff, the people arm themselves with stones and watch. If she moves, they throw the stones. If she doesn't, they go home. The body is left where it is for the birds and the animals. Joseph was being put to a test. He did not want Mary to die. He loved her. He could, under the law, pay money to put her away, to have her sent to some remote place. There she could have her baby and remain. A third possibility would be Joseph to swallow his pride, proceed with the wedding, and hope that there would not be too much comment in the town over a six-month baby. He was dwelling upon the possibilities one night in bed, and suddenly the carpenter made up his mind. He would put Mary away privately. It would break his heart, and he knew that he could not love anyone else, but it would just be, at the same time, merciful. Within a few moments after the decision was reached, relaxation came to Joseph and he slept. In sleep he was visited by an angel. The spirit said to him, Joseph, son of David, do not scruple to take Mary, your wife, into your home. Her conception was wrought by the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. When Joseph awakened, he remembered the dream, and he wondered if his forlorn hopes were reaching for rationalization. A dream was nothing more than a dream. His unconscious wishes might be fulfilled in sleep. Still, if this were so, he would never dream of blasphemy in which the pregnancy was excused by attributing it to God. Besides, the dream fulfilled an old prophecy to the letter, Behold, the virgin will be pregnant and give birth to a son, who will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Joseph felt refreshed. He felt happy. The more he dwelt upon the dream, the more clearly he saw the hand of God revealing a great truth to him. It required restraint to go to work, making stalls and tables and wooden hangers for utensils and closets for garments. He longed to hurry to Mary's house, yelling, I know, I know. His patience manifested itself, and he waited until the proper time after supper. And when he saw his first glance, Mary knew that he knew before he took her for an evening walk to explain. God had tried both of these people, and they had not failed him. Still, Joseph was worried because he did not understand what part he was to play, nor how best to interpret the will of God. The scripture plainly said that the Messiah would be born of a virgin, and Joseph interpreted this to mean 
that he would have no prerogatives as a husband now or ever. The following week, they were married, and Joseph took Mary to his home. One of his worries, he confided to Mary, was that if the old prophecy of Messiah was to be fulfilled, then something was wrong because someone knew that the sacred scripture said the king of kings would be born in Bethlehem, the city of David. The infant would be born in Nazareth, a little place over 90 miles north of Bethlehem. She had no intention of traveling anywhere, Mary said. She was going to remain here in Nazareth. In the summer months and in the early autumn, the older women of the town noticed that she was pregnant, and they counseled her to remain close to her home. She would not go, go see Elizabeth's baby, so why should she consider traveling to Bethlehem? Joseph nodded. That was the way he felt. He had never been to Bethlehem, and he had no intentions of going there. That concludes the reading of chapter 2. I'll see you tomorrow for chapter 3. Hope you have a great day.